Hello and welcome back to season two of Fertility Talks, the Therapy Fertility Podcast. I'm your host Renee Van Medin and I'm so excited to be back hosting our second season of this podcast. Each week I will be sitting down with a different guest and chatting all things fertility. As always, our hope is that through this series, through honest conversation and information, we can strip away some of the stigma that sometimes comes hand in hand with infertility and fertility treatment in Ireland. Today, I have in studio with us Avril Flynn, who is a Dublin-based midwife, childbirth educator and mum of one. But not only that, she is also one of my very dear friends and I have been dying to get her onto this podcast, so I'm very excited for today. Welcome, Avril. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to be here. Um, I think the problem with us today is going to be getting us to stop talking. Yeah, that is. We both we both love to chat. And we actually met originally on a podcast, so there's there's a circular loveliness to this. It is, isn't it? It's um yeah, it's it's gonna be good. So, um to introduce you to our viewers and listeners, maybe you could just tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I am a midwife. I got into midwifery a little bit later. Um, I've worked in the area for about 15 years. Uh, I obviously look about 12. So, you know, I started when I was like (laughs) nine months old. I was like the doogie Iser of the (laughs) midwifery world. Uh, No, I just. um, I also worked as a fertility nurse for about two years. And then when I got pregnant with my own son um, after some issues, I decided to set up um, my own practice providing childbirth education. birth support uh fertility I suppose more support in the in the entire journey so Mm -hmm. covering from preconception right the way to but very importantly for me um as a queer person and as an advocate that it was to ensure in my practice that people from the entire rainbow family spectrum the LBGTQI Mm -hmm. plus um spectrum were at the heart of my practice mm. so I don't just provide classes for pregnant women I pres- pr- provide for pregnant people mm. um for straight couples gay couples singles from every spectra spectrum and mm-hmm. um, people from the trans community mm-hmm. non-binary folk the whole gambit and that is not something that, as you well know, um, is, is is still there is not very inclusive. Um, and I very much want to, I suppose, highlight that and change that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I for sure, like from our own experience of going through fertility treatment, from the supports that were available to us um, with accessing those services, when it came to choosing a sperm donor, um, all the nuances around that. Um, then when it came to actually being pregnant and the services that were available, I, I always say I wish I had known you when oh, <laughs> when I was pregnant so the first time because we only met when I was pregnant the second time. Um, but, you know, everyone needs someone like you who you know gets it and you know yeah, but it's more important than that there's a heteronormative construct around all of the, these things and I don't mm-hmm. think people understand that in a lot of heteronormity there's a big slice of misogyny mm. so we're not just doing um the lbgtqi plus community out of a service we're actually uh kind of bolstering up the patriarchy mm. and uh, midwifery uh, shouldn't be political, but it is. Mm. And um, supporting real choice, women's choice and people's choice means that you meet people where they are. And it's incumbent on us as professionals to get it out of our heads mm. in assuming that every person we meet is a heteronormative cisgendered woman um, who has a, a male partner or husband. That's just not reality um queer people want to have kids and want to have access to um the full gambit of everything just as much as straight people and i i don't think the straight community get that mm. um i think for a lot of people from um the queer community because they were seen as not being able in inverted commas to have families People assume they didn't want that. And I think that's 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 a crazy assumption to make. 
all of the research would suggest that um, there's actually more queer young people that actually want to have a family mm. than straight uh, than straight women. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to, you know, if we're really going to be intersectional in our advocacy, mm. then we need inclusivity. And, and that needs to be right across the board and not to shy away from, um, I think, I suppose people are so afraid of using, I suppose, the wrong words mm. um, that it's OK to make a mistake, but it's the fact that you try. Yeah. You yeah. know, and um, it's not OK in this day and age that anyone would access um, a parenting or fertility service and feel that because of their uh, gender identity or sexuality that they don't deserve the best quality care. Mm. And that to me is inherently wrong and yeah. is something that I will rail against. And the funny thing about me, I'm a queer woman, but I'm in, I married the straightest man in the world and very happily so. <laughs> but um, I suppose I'm able to, people assume I'm a heteronormative person and that's fine. People make assumptions, but that's actually a bit of a superpower because you get to see what people really think of us and mm, mm-hmm. um, when you know they think we're not listening <laughs> <laughs> and I find that a really good ability to learn and to mm. educate and a, a really safe space to go well maybe if you looked at things this way um because that's how I think you move hearts and minds yeah I, I guess when you're looking at like the services we're talking about like it's it's really basic it's you know it's from going to your GP it's getting some testing done in a fertility clinic it's going to antenatal appointments it's going to a breastfeeding class or a a baby feeding class it's going to um you know pregnancy exercise classes or yoga classes or like there are so many stops along the way in any sort of like becoming a parent journey whether that's actually physically Um, you know, going through fertility treatment, conceiving naturally, adopting, surrogacy, whatever that looks like for you to becoming a parent. There are so many services and people that and professionals that you come into contact with along the way. And I know every single one of those professionals and services that we encountered along the way saw me and assumed that I was, you know, a straight woman and I had a husband. And every single time I encountered that along the way, it's almost like you have to come out multiple every times every time because you have to yeah. explain yourself, and you, then you, or else you yeah, have yeah. to just not say anything because you're just too tired. Yeah, and you're like, yeah, sure. And and that to me is just apparent. Why is that so? Mm. It's such an easy thing, actually. It's not a great mind shift and, to and, just and, not assume. And how how would you kind of um you know encourage people to do that? Literally By just asking questions mm. and educating yourself. You know, none of these, uh, no, nobody in the queer community is is new. <laughs> you know, people have been queer, gay, lesbian, bi and trans throughout the millennia. So none of this is new. Mm. But as a as a country and as a society, we've moved quite quickly in one direction by legalizing gay marriage. And that was wonderful. But there is still a huge um, discrepancy with how, because I married a man Mm. and how Felix and how my maternity experience and how other people's parenting experience. And the shift is not that great to just not assume. Yeah. It's like, it's It's literally literally that simple. Don't assume. And if you don't know, ask but in a polite way you know you know it's like the the shift when there were no such thing as single mothers you know back Mm. when you know the church had its vice grip on everything and um the inverted shame of that and it would you know people would talk in a similar vein about being a single mother in a maternity ward and feeling that inherent shame because people assumed and you know putting on a fake ring it's not that different so I think you know, compassionate care starts with giving a shit. Mm-hmm. Excuse my French. Yeah. Uh, sorry, giving a damn. Um, and it's not that hard. You don't have to actually even support mm. to be compassionate and to see that your role as a healthcare professional is to care 
for everyone mm. where they are. Yeah. And if you're not sure, just ask. Yeah. But in a polite and respectful way. Um, you know, it always makes me scream laughing the obsession that straight people have with the kind of sexual elements of queer people. They're obsessed with it. Um, maybe because they should have tried it. No, I guess. <laughs> but um, that, you know, every person is just a person mm. with similar hopes and dreams. And mm. um, everybody wants to be respected and happy. And if you are in a caring profession, it is your absolute job. Mm. Whether whatever your own personal belief or whatever is to just get that people just want to be it's that simple and particularly with parenting because generally um unless you're very lucky in the type of queer relationship you have you more than likely don't have a uterus and sperm it, or you might but it's it's more unusual that you would yep. you generally might have a lot of sperm or a lot of eggs or two, two uteruses, uteruses. <laughs> and so for people to make a family, it's a real decision and it's there are a lot more hoops to jump through. Mm. And therefore, by the time that they actually get, hopefully, to a, a pregnancy, their journey has been long. And, you know, why would any of us make that more challenging? It, it, it blows my mind, you know, and it's not OK to not get it. Yeah. Like, just no, you, you have to not assume, ask, like even the way the computer systems are set up in the HSE and in the maternity systems, like there isn't a space for a partner to. Yeah. It is mum and dad. Yeah. I, do you know, like. I often think like, why would it be so hard to just, you know, parent, parent one parent. and parent two? <laughs> yeah. And I suppose there, like this subject can be made very complex, mm. but I actually like to break it down. Mm. Do you believe in respect? Do you mm. believe that people have a want and a wish to be a parent? How can you support that? How can you support their journey? How can you make that road a little bit easier and a little bit shorter? Yeah. That's simple. It, you know, it's it's it, you don't have to politicize parenthood in that way. Mm. Um, and it's not your job. It's not my job as a midwife or as a childbirth educator. It's my job to make sure that people feel supported mm. and cared for because that is not that is totally lacking in the public system. Yeah. And that really needs to change. Yeah. So how do you do that? Like in, in your work and, and the couples and particularly the, the queer couples that you see yeah. or the queer people that you see, um, how do you do that? Like from, so you know, do you I'm, get people coming to you in the preconception? Yeah, kind of? absolutely. Yeah. And I, I support people who have gone through adoption, both um, international and inter-country in, in Ireland. I've supported people that have gone through all the different types of um, surrogacy routes and um, so I'm generally in touch with people sometimes they ring me when you know their little person is about to arrive um, but the big understanding is that I'm able to give them practical information mm. as to how do you keep a baby alive for 24 but you know <laughs> you don't get taught this stuff in school and um, like you, if you are a gay male couple, you can't go to a public antenatal class. Yeah. You're not allowed. Yeah. There's no space for you. There's no, there is no public service for mm. you. So where do you find out how to change a nappy and how to feed a baby and how to bath a baby? Um, you know, and, and just the psychological support of having somebody on the phone um, kind of like um, a big sister yeah. that you can ring and ask anything with no judgment. And also that I get it. I understand where you are. And also um, I'm a hypnobirth practitioner and a mindfulness teacher. So we're able to do lovely connection exercises. Um, and it works with straight couples as well to get them to really feel like they're about to be a, you know, a parent mm. and that they can get in touch with the pregnancy element of it even if they're not physically pregnant yeah um so the queer couples that come to you and obviously there are some very obvious ones you know 
with regards to obvious certain, queer people. Yeah, obvious yeah. <laughs> the the obvious queer people, <laughs> as opposed to the like stealth ones. <laughs> um, but you know, there are some obvious barriers that yes. people would face when it comes to accessing fertility services, like surrogacy is not allowed at this current point in Ireland. It will be soon, but at the moment it is not. Um, but when it comes to say like a same sex female couple or um, a female person with a trans male partner, what are the barriers that the you know couples face when it comes to accessing fertility services? Well, the first one is financial, um, which is a big one. We, we don't provide, uh, you know, financial help for that. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing is you actually have to do quite a lot of research mm. to get really good quality information mm. of how stuff works mm. and how stuff is, um, how the how how it could work and the different choices. You know, you can do reciprocal IVF, which you know, um, or you can do known donor you can do unknown donor and until you go down the rabbit hole you assume that all of this will have a legal standing Mm. and then to your horror you find out it doesn't Mm. and so there's a lot of trust as a queer person to be a parent Mm. there's a lot of trust um because the road might be long but also the legal standing isn't guaranteed and that's a real tough one and I I don't think people understand that I think Mm. people assumed I know people assumed when gay marriage came in that people would have an automatic right and as well you know to my abject horror still that's not the case Mm. and um and then there's a psychological barrier Mm. as well in that um you know, if you're a trans man, um, you whether you're on hormones or not, there can be it can bring up a huge amount of body dysphoria, um, around the the pregnancy, mm. um, and then there's also the judgy heads on people, and as I say to every parent, you don't have to tell people your story unless mm. you want to, and I see you, I respect you, and. I know you're going to make a great parent mm. because you want this. And that's, don't you think that that's the yeah. biggest thing for parents to actually really want it? Yeah, Like no sure. queer person really gets accidentally pregnant. No. It's not possible. No. You know, you do, like it doesn't no. happen. So it's a real um, wanted and thought of and mm. saved for thing. Yeah. And um, all of the research, which I love to tell people when I get into the various debates, and um, what every child needs is stability and love. That's it. Mm. That is it. Yeah. It is not the family. Yeah, family they don't need two parents. They don't need. Kids don't. Yeah, kids yeah. don't actually care. Yeah. As long as there is as long as a person in, a, a, or a unit, a unit yeah. or a person yeah. who loves them and yeah. makes them a priority. That's a happy kid. Yeah. That's it. And all of the research all of the there's some really good really high quality research coming out from both psychological and health Mm. and that that's a fact and I think that's very important to push because the rhetoric that some of the right wingers would use is you know uh, a kid needs a mom and a dad like will you get away people have been brought up by their grandparents by an aunt by an uncle by a single parent like that's rot and the research backs that up so that's just not true but um, for younger queer people, um, think about your fertility j- like now. Yeah. And I know that sounds really weird, but um, I suppose because when you come out, your adolescence might be extended a little bit mm-hmm. or your journey to discovering yourself might be a little bit longer. And then all of a sudden you're 45 and then it's a lot mm-hmm. more challenging to be a parent. So you know, it is a possibility for you and if it's something that you want, but do think about it sooner rather than later as we would advise all people. Um, And uh, I was delighted, I've contributed an article, there's a really brilliant journal called The Student Midwife Mm. in the UK and they're doing for April um, an LBGTQI plus focused article, which is just really brilliant. And I've written... Um, an article on it which is pathways to parenthood from an LBGTQI plus which kind of just in in short lists yeah and it was actually really nice compiling the list to see the options 
Um, and the big thing is let, you know, you and I worry about the legalities and fight, fight the corner. Mm. But if you want to have, if you want to be a parent, if that's in your go for it. You can do it, yeah. You can do it. There are, there are, if there, there's ways and means. Yeah. And there is a wonderful community of parents there. Yeah. That have trod the boards for you. Yeah. And um, so if it's something that you want to talk about it and yeah. ask, you know, um, but there, there, there's a great support network there, and it's lovely. Like there's, you know, when we go to Equality for Children events. It just makes my heart so happy to see so many happy kids mm-hmm. and so many success stories because every single one of those families has had a journey. Yeah, yeah. You know, because you have to make much more conscious decisions. And that just absolutely gladdens my heart to see all those little smiley yeah. happy faces. And the cute babies. Lots of cute babies. Oh, so cute babies. Um, something you said there, which I think is really important. I think a lot of people, when you are queer and you know you're gonna have to maybe access donor sperm for example to grow your family there's kind of an assumption that there are no pre-existing fertility issues there because yes, you kind that of it's think just a matter of it's just yeah, a matter of bringing needing, the sperm bank exactly yeah and that's obviously not the case just as it is not the case for heterosexual couples who assume they're just going to have unprotected sex and they're going to get pregnant yeah so I think it is really important that all people, regardless of what your situation is, what your sexuality is, that you kind of learn about your fertility earlier on and don't Absolutely. leave it until and, you're... And if you know early on that there might be a challenge, y- you can make different decisions. Mm. And uh, like we were talking before we kind of came on air, the the really big thing is that the younger, you know, you are born, if you are, um, if you're born with a uterus and ovaries, your ovaries begin to age from the moment of conception, which is it's really terrifying. cruel. <laughs> Isn't That's it? That's so mean. Um, it's like you haven't even born yet. <laughs> no, but you, you're born with your entire yeah. possibility. Yeah. And I love that image, actually, of when you were in your birth parent and in yeah well we, we we put that on the therapy fertility um, your social. granny we had put that your on yeah we put that on our over, instagram yeah. a few weeks so ago so cool it's so cool but you know it's even cooler because in our case of reciprocal ivf think about that okay so if you think of that image of the granny I the know. baby and then the the the, the the eggs yeah that's so that image is my mother-in-law I know. carrying audrey and then in audrey's ovaries are the eggs that so, turned into the embryos and the babies that I carry which kids. is just like that's insane right I just it, like oh it's just brilliant but if you go in and understand your fertility like I've said this to you before why are we not teaching kids at school actual real sexual health and I know advice? we're just teaching them not how not to get pregnant that's no a, do you know what no I think it definitely is it there is changing, changing but it depends on where you go and what school you go to and what school you go yeah, to and the ethos of the of school course. but there is not across the board and still um ter- like they don't teach young gay kids how to have gay sex yeah it's, it, like you know you that yeah. leads to its own drama mm-hmm. let me tell you um but you've to figure it out you know there's no you know and that to me is crazy in the same way that why aren't you taught if you're thinking of having a family get your fertility checked Mm. before you're 30 Mm. because then you might need to speed up your life plan Mm -hmm. if it's something that you want yeah um because there's nothing more painful than if it's something that you really really want and unfortunately because time is the cruelest of cruelest of mistresses you've timed out like that's awful but yet there are still other possibilities but again there's a financial strain on that um and when gay men go down the surrogacy route that can be very complicated because Mm. um it's not legally allowed in ireland so generally they have to go to either canada america because there's a you have to be able to adopt basically and to be able to fly back um, which is very challenging and that's what I would love people listening to the podcast to just understand what a journey people have been on Mm. and 
and um, not assume that people just don't want a family. You just yeah. don't know. It seems like people commenting on, you know, when are you having another? Yeah, even, yeah, no, yeah. For sh- yeah, for sure. For like for straight couples or seemingly straight couples. Yes. And if you have one kid, you get asked and you, yeah. get, and you get asked this all the time. Yes. When when is your next? Yeah. And you don't know what you don't know what you know journey that that family has been yeah and I mean that's something like I can't have any more um babies and I used to just say oh one and done as a protective measure Mm. because it was just too painful Mm. to actually go well I can't I'm you know me poor old bits have have (laughs) have given up the ghost (laughs) but at least he's cute my one little person is cute cute. and you have a fur baby oh I do I have Finn the fur baby and I actually it's his birthday in two days Oh wow! So I'm gonna you have to come over for a bit of yeah, cake for yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, one thing I want to talk yes. about is um, using donor sperm because yes. a lot of the female couples that are coming to therapy are asking, like, how you know, and people go down this rabbit hole of, yeah. of like, it. I need to per- pick the perfect donor. Um, what is your experience with parents who use either donor sperm, donor They're eggs? Have really good looking kids. <laughs> <laughs> We, I guess we, we do, you, have, but you do. But to be fair, I think most of the good looks come from my wife's side. So yeah, the, the girls are the image. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um. So what's your experience of? So it's very, it's very much about. So generally speaking, people either want a familial resemblance, and you can go. So when you go, there are different clinics, mm. and there are different. Um, kind of levels of so for example you can buy um, a load of straws so a load of particular samples so that if you and your um, partner who also has a uterus you could have the same uh, male parent so that they would have um, that Kids. There would be that by genetic exactly. connection. Exactly, or you can do reciprocal IVF, yeah. or there are, there are different settings. But in choosing a donor, sometimes people can be a little bit too prescriptive. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, if the donor is healthy, um, like genetics are funny. So, you know, I would always, what I always advise is always go for the healthy donor. Yeah. And also make sure that wherever you're getting it has you know, good and strict um, policies with regards, you know, that there isn't 50 other people in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, so like, for example, the sperm bank that we work with is European Sperm Bank and they have a cutoff point of three families And they have in Ireland. very strict. It's very strict. Yeah, and they so, have very strict health, um, you know. But you see, people read, you know, a magazine and it that has some like you, yeah oh no you some hear these weirdo tried to impregnate 60 people and well, like, I, have, I have this actually happened I know, I'm not lying I know you know was it I, I I'm just pulling this out of the air but I think it was like the Netherlands or it was somewhere that, and there was there was well, some, there was a fertility doctor who ran a clinic and used his own, own sperm own sperm yeah as like the donor and do you know sperm? how it came out how um genetic testing and they, they all kind of linked back to this one Yeah, clinic. so 23 and Me is discovering so many family secrets. <laughs> you know, you have two, 27 half siblings. What? That's insane. Um, we, but, d- we do not endorse that. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, please, absolutely it's, no. It's terrible. And that's what you need to go to a good quality clinic that understands. So some clinics, um, some Irish clinics, don't have any supporter facilities for the queer community and mm. um, they won't say that outright yeah but they don't so if go to a clinic that that is going to support you and that you're going to feel comfortable in that was actually one of the questions I had for you yeah. is how important is it to choose care providers who are inclusive and have a really deep understanding of the nuances of the LGBTQ you know, community pregnancy and fertility are 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 stressful enough mm. Um, you need to be with people that support you on your journey that again you don't have to come out every time you go for an appointment or that um, ask really irrelevant and very personal questions because they're nosy um, so there are some brilliant practitioners and there's some brilliant info um, but ask people who have gone down the path mm. Rather than assume what their experience was, where exactly, they would recommend, yeah. exactly, and like like that, you know, sometimes people will 
prefer a particular care provider. You know, sometimes people yeah, prefer. Um, and, you know, you'll know by talking to people what their actual experience is, because it can be profoundly distressing. You know, when you go to somewhere and your hopes are up and actually you get a big bag of homophobia. Mm. So not only are you coming out, you know, without a lot of supportive information, but you've had to be hurt Mm. on a level that is irrelevant to your parenting journey. Mm. So don't allow yourself, you know, for that to happen. Go to somewhere that you know people have been to and have had a good experience. Okay, finally, to finish up. Oh, that's blown. I know. What advice would you give to anyone who is preparing to start their family through some form of fertility treatment? Yeah, just to go for it um, and to make sure that um, not to hide it. We all need support. There is no shame. So many people go through this silently and I, I hate the thought of that. And um, for queer people in particular, there are some really good resources and um, like Equality for Children, but just peer support, which is it's lovely. It's it, you know, there's it's a real family. Um, but there's the Queer Birth Club, um, a wonderful um, advocate, AJ Silver and um, follow people like Freddie McConnell, um, who is Seahorse dad, who is just an amazing man um, who has just had a second little person but had a very challenging mm. birth story on a second little person which I'm still trying to process um, there's also wonderful um, midwife Laura Henry and they are um, actually editor of the student midwife so um, I know that they have um, not that they would admit it because they are the most gorgeous person but they would never give themselves credit but you know People like Laura are changing the lexicon around birth to be more inclusive. And that's why I love that the student midwife is coming out with that. And with regards to fertility, there's always hope. There's always hope. And, um, you know, get if you have the support on your journey, just don't go down the road on your own. Mm. Have somebody holding you up and holding your hand um, because it's it's lonely enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for oh, just, coming I and chatting. Up. Yeah, thank um, you so much. And like, and it is wonderful to have this resource yeah. for people to listen to and get real information. Yeah. Well, I think you're awesome as well, and you know the support that I you provide. You. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Fertility Talks, the Therapy Fertility Podcast. If you have, please rate, review and subscribe. For more information on the services we offer, you can visit www.therapyfertility.com.